All right. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining us for Northern Now, the digital event series presented by NMU Alumni Relations for Alumni and Friends. My name is Kylie Bunting. I'm the digital engagement architect of Alumni Relations here at NMU, and I'm really glad that you've joined us for tonight's cooking segment. We're excited to continue this series and to kick off summer with some delicious campfire recipes. But first, I just want to go through a few logistics. So while we are unable to see and hear you in this webinar format, we still want to hear from you. So Diane and I will be monitoring the Q&A section and the chat as well. So if you have any questions or comments for our chefs, please use the Q&A um, the Q and A function at the bottom of your screen. You can also use the chat function um, to chat with fellow alumni and friends who are also tuning in. A quick note on that, in the chat window, there's a drop down menu to send chat to hosts and panelists or to everyone. This is automatically defaulted just to hosts and panelists. So if you wanna chat with everybody else, make sure you change that to everyone. Now, just to talk about some upcoming events, um, Northern Now is taking a pause for the summer. We'll return in the fall with all new programming. So if you have any topics that you'd like to hear about, please don't hesitate to let us know. Couple of upcoming alumni events. This Saturday, our regional hub leader in Tampa, Cameron West, is hosting an informal gathering in downtown Tampa. And also we're heading to Chicago on June 24th for an official in-person alumni reception, our first one in two years. So we are excited about that. Um, visit nmu.edu for more information and to RSVP for these events. Also save the date for homecoming. It is September 23rd and 24th. Also, I just wanna take a quick moment to mention Wildcats Connect, which is a platform for alumni and students to ask and offer advice. It's a great way to help out NMU students to stay connected to the university and also get in touch with fellow alumni. You can find out more about that on our website as well. And don't forget to follow us on social media. So now I would like to welcome our moderator, Diane Stone, a 2010 NMU grad and current NMU events manager. Welcome, Diane. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Kylie, and um, thank you for having me again. Um, <clears throat> I'm thrilled to inter introduce tonight's chef and excited, to, excited for them to show you some great recipes to cook over the campfire. First, I'd like to welcome Chef Alden Griffith, a 2010 NMU graduate and the executive chef of dining services at NMU. Chef Alden joined our team at the beginning of 2020. After years of experience in the industry, ranging from ice cream to baking to high volume line cooking to teaching. She loves sharing her knowledge and experience to help folks feel more comfortable in the kitchen. And joining Chef Alden is Trixie Magrin Jacobson, a current student of the Hospitality Management Program at NMU. Trixie Trixie will be entering her third year this fall and is the vice president and treasurer of the hospitality club on campus, as well as an active member of the American Culinary Federation. In addition to being a student, she is currently working an internship at Northern Michigan University Dining, supporting the reopening of Tamaki and Smoothie King and working in the Northern Center, Center Catering Kitchen. While she plans on continuing her education through experience after college, she hopes to have her own business in the future and gain her certifications. Welcome Chef Alden and Trixie. Thank you very much, Diane. We're so excited to be here today. This is one of the my favorite things to do as a chef is to talk about food and maybe uh, have people think about familiar dishes a little differently. And so that's what we're doing today is I'm going to show you three recipes and Trixie's going to show you two. Um, we both have entrees for you to see today. We both have desserts. And then I have, of course, I finish out of the drink every time. So we also have a really cool smoked drink. We get to play a little bit with fire today Woo! with chefs love fire. So today uh, we're going to start off 
with a pretty classic, it's a fireside dinner, something that I grew up doing. We, we grew up going camping specifically. I remember we used to camp this one place called days Creek in Oregon. And my parents would build this campfire and we would assemble these, these dinners in foil. And usually they were like ground beef or chicken with veggies. And I'm just going to show you something that's very, uh, very akin to what we would see here in the UP and something that you can really make your guests. If you're doing this at your home, you could do this in your oven or on your grill. And you can also do this campfire side on your coals and they can go, Ooh, ah, this is also a really great recipe to use when you are out fishing and you want to do something really great with your fish. This recipe uh, is really good for that. So we're going to dive right in and get started. So what I have here is just some foil and I'm going to show you actually two different ways today. I've got foil and this is great for at home on your grill in your oven or campfire on some nice coals. If you're gonna cook this dinner on your coals, just make sure that your fire is going for a while before you start your dinner because you have to have a nice bed of coals to cook on when you're, when you're at your fireside. Uh, another way to cook this is in parchment. And I have cut a piece of parchment in a, the shape of a heart, aw. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you how you can do both of these ways. This way is called en papillote, which is fancy for in paper, and you can awe your guests. We do these in fancy restaurants and we charge a lot of money for it and it's awesome. So you can really wow your guests with this one too. But you're gonna see that they have the same ingredients and they're gonna come out the same, but this one you would do on your grill and this one you could do in your oven and this, they are both awesome and this one just looks fancier. So we're gonna start with a little bit of oil. And this is an olive oil canola blend. We like it here in the kitchen because the olive oil adds a lot of flavor, but then the canola helps with protecting from like burning. You know, we're going to put this right in the middle, just a little bit of olive oil, um, canola blend. You can use whatever. Okay. Then we're going to have, I have some potatoes here that are cut really thin. That's important because if you're cooking fireside, especially since we're going to be using white fish today, we wanna make sure that our potatoes cook in the same amount of time as the rest of our dish. Sometimes if you're not careful, your potatoes will take a lot longer. So we're just gonna make a bed of potatoes. I remember we used to take all of our stuff to the fireside, like our campsite, and then we would get our fire going. And then we would sit there with like, you know, our dirty hands that we washed with like lake water. I loved it so much when I was a kid and our like cutting board and everything. And we would put these meals together. And it was one of the coolest things I thought. I thought my parents were the coolest ever doing this. So then we have some parsnips. I love parsnips. To me, they're like carrot candy. They're sweet, aromatic, and they go great with fish. And so that's why we have parsnips today. So I'm just going to layer these parsnips. Again, I cut them really thin to make sure that they cook in the same amount of time as my fish. And I'm just putting a layer on there, making a bed of veggies. Then so for a little flavor, I've got some thinly sliced onions. I'm going to put those down next. Depends on how much you like onions is how much you're going to put in there. Put that in there. Then once you have your little bed of veggies, like I said, this could be any veggies you want. Just make sure when you cut them that you cut them nice and thin so they cook at the same rate as your protein. I have some beautiful white fish from Phil's. That's gorgeous. I mean, these are half fillets. They're so big right now. I'm gonna just lay those right on top like that. Then I'm gonna take oil again. This is really, this don't skip this step. This is very important and kind of liberally drizzle some oil over the top. The reason that's important is because the oil will help keep your fish nice and moist. Same with when you trap it, we're going to trap it in this pocket, right? And so there's no moisture that escapes. So there, and also that'll help us with our seasoning. This is a mix of what's in the recipe, which is dill, paprika, garlic, salt, and pepper. Put that there. And what's important is I did use dried dill. If you have fresh dill, of course it's better, 
But when you're on a camping trip, are you really going to carry fresh dill around because it's so tender and it will bruise easily and wilt and, you know, so you use dried spices. So that's what I have here. I like the paprika because it has like kind of sweet component and also it will help kind of with the color. So I am going to season liberally because remember that's your seasoning for your whole dish. Another reason I love these is that you can personalize these really well. And the reason that's important is say someone doesn't like onions. Well, if you're building individual meals for people, just leave the onions off. So I have that there. Now for this one, the campfire one, what we're gonna do is we're going to close her up by bringing the tops together and then curling them over like that. Then we're gonna go to the side, do the same thing here, press it down and see we have this perfect little pouch and see it, it holds together really well. This is just a regular aluminum foil. For this one, it's a little more involved, but not much, I promise. You take this like this, fold it over. You're gonna start at the top of your heart and you're gonna press down. Then you're gonna fold again. Make sure you can see that, press down, fold again. And you're just gonna go around the edge of your heart like this. And as you can see, it makes this beautiful little pouch. And then this tail here, I always give it a twist and tuck it under. And see, you have this gorgeous pouch. And then if I were to cook this in an oven, I just put it on a little sheet tray, okay? I'm gonna put this in here for now and we're gonna do magic of TV. So I'm gonna step away for 10 seconds. I'll be right back. And look at that, I magically have two that are all done. So we are gonna go right here. Oh, you know what I forgot to do? Silly me, I forgot to put the lemons on there. So you're gonna put lemons on top too. That's really important because that lemon is really nice in there. Good news though. Hey, I have Chef, lemons. I have a question. Yes, please. For the parchment paper, can you use any shape or do you have to use a heart? One of so our you guests are You don't have to use a heart, but the reason that the heart is the standard for restaurants is because when, as you saw, I folded it around, it made like a perfect pouch and that little tail at the end, you tuck under and that's why you use the, that's why we use the heart but you don't have to use a heart. So if we open this up now, we can see this, the great reveal. Ta-da! We have this beautiful filet of fish that's perfectly cooked. Our potatoes are nice and soft. We have our nice yummy parsnips. That lemon, all those juices soak down in there, kind of make a little sauce in the bottom. And you have a meal for one right here, a nice hearty meal. So that is our fireside dinner. Now, if you're doing all this the coals, it takes about 15, 20 minutes on the bed of coals and you have to make sure to rotate it a lot so that you're not burning. Cause obviously some parts of the coals are hotter than others. If you're doing it in the oven, it's about 400 degrees at home. That's probably gonna take about 15 to 20 minutes, closer to 15 than 20. And you're just going to check it. I always check it. My, I, I eyeball it. If you look at the fish, I'm gonna have you come in here and look, see how it, it's this little here, your fish will start to pull away a little and section. And that's when you know it's done and you're gonna wanna pull it out of the oven. These hold really well too, because you've trapped all that moisture in there. And part of the cooking is actually steaming because there's nowhere for that moisture to go. And so the reason that's nice is that if you do these and you're a few minutes ahead of schedule, you don't have to worry about your fish drying out, just keep them sealed and in a warm, like 100 to 150, well, 130 to 150 degrees, and they'll stay nice and warm and then they won't be dried out. And no one wants dried out white fish. You, you paid a pretty penny for that beautiful white fish. Don't dry it out. So that's really nice about these is just keep them sealed. And when you do the impapiote one, it's always fun. One component of that is you serve it the pouch right on the plate like this. And you actually have the guest rip it open and there's steam and there's all the odors and it looks really fancy. And then you look fancy. So, and that is your 
fireside dinner. So then now Trixie is gonna show you some pretty awesome stuffed bell peppers. That's beautiful, Chef. Thank you, Chef Alden. I really appreciate you taking me on for this. Um, today, I'm gonna be showing you a stuffed bell pepper. Um, a main focus for when thinking through for these recipes is leaving no trace on the trail. Um, as an avid hiker uh, throughout the trails of Marquette, um, you always take out what you bring in and this goes right into your meals as well. So when we're thinking about the bell pepper, what we've done is I've taken all the seeds out and I've literally just taken off the top. You don't even have to worry about removing the stem because this will become your whole container. Um, and you can eat everything but the seeds and stem and that's all you have to bring out with you. Um, I've also made this meal vegetarian, um, but you can easily uh, replace the, um, some of the ingredients with meat if you prefer. And going into the ingredients, my, our main focus today will be some wild mushrooms. Uh, we're gonna focus on today is lion's mane. Lion's mane is native to Michigan. You can find it in kind of the late fall. Um, there's three varieties and this all depends on how their teeth for lack of words, falls off the main lion's mane. As you can see, lion's mane comes from kind of a center point and it grows from the center point into this kind of little ball. And as you can see, these teeth tell what type of variety the lion's mane is. Other great varieties are shiitake. Shiitake mushrooms aren't as native to uh, Michigan but are easily sourced through local farms. Um, and other great varieties are oyster as well. But you can add any variety of mushroom you prefer, even baby bells do a great addition for this meal. Another thing, a great source of protein is beans. Um, I'm using great Northern white beans here. Um, and these are your, one of your main protein sources along with the mushrooms. Mushrooms and beans um, will provide you the energy you need for the rest of the trail. And finally, we will also have some wild rice. Um, I have cooked this wild rice in a veg stock to give it a little more burst of flavor, um, but you can also use brown rice or white rice if wild rice isn't your preferred texture. Um, to begin with this recipe, you're gonna take your standard mirepoix, which is 50% onions, 25% celery, and 25% carrot. And you're going to throw this onto your cast iron um, or Dutch oven. Um, you're going to use this right when the flame is hot, uh, when you're working over the fire or even just over your oven, and you're going to cook these until tenderized. Um, after they start tenderizing, you can add your salt, pepper, mushrooms, um, and your other seasonings as well. We will add some rosemary. You can use fresh, or if you're on the trail, you can use dried just as well. Uh, we also have some thyme here. And like with fresh, you don't have to use as much because fresh is very powerful. Um, but if you look on your recipes, I do have the conversions for you if you are going to use dried. Uh, another spice that we will use is nutmeg. I always love adding a little nutmeg to my mushrooms um, and as well as garlic. Um, finally, uh, we have some nutritional yeast, which we will finish off the dish um, once before we put it in. So as I was continuing, we have the mirepoix, which has now been tenderized with our spices. Um, we, then you're going to add your mushrooms and cook, finish it off the mushrooms until those are tenderized as well. You're going to combine the wild rice, the, your mirepoix and sauteed mushroom, your beans, and you're gonna to top it off with nutritional yeast. Nutritional yeast is a great vegan alternative to add a little cheesy flavor um, to your dishes. Um, the nutritional yeast also has a lot of great vitamins and um, nutritional value to it. And that's why it's always seen in a lot of vegan dishes. Um, and finally, you will end up with this mixture. This will be your final mixture. This is what you're looking for. Um, Without the bell pepper, this is a great side dish to many other entrees or other proteins. Um, and you will add this to your bell pepper. Your recipe counts for six. I will be stuffing three. And it is simply as you just stuff it into the pepper. Um, what I'm gonna do here is just how you would on the campsite. You're just gonna try to stuff it into all the crevices. Uh, try not to leave a lot of room as this will kind of sink in once you start cooking it, it down. So I'm gonna make sure that I'm really stuffing these peppers before I throw them into the Dutch oven. By this time now, your 
fire should start toning down and getting ready for your peppers to be thrown in. Because when we throw our peppers in, we don't want a, roar, a roaring fire. We want coals, we want a um, kind of a streamlined process to create a baking sensation for our peppers. Um, then once you put them into the Dutch oven, you are going to leave them there for about 20 to 35 minutes. This depends on the intensity of the fire. I would suggest checking every five to 10 minutes to make sure your peppers don't burn. Um, but just moving the coals, making sure the fire is stabilized to make sure you get a complete cooking process. Uh, another way you can do this is you can wrap your bell peppers in tin foil and kind of nestle them into the coals. Um, this is another great alternative if you can't carry the Dutch oven with you. Um, however, I would keep an even closer eye on them as they are closer to the flame. Uh, if you're doing this at home, 400 degree oven for about 30 to 40 minutes and cook until tenderized. And as the magic of TV, we are going to pull out our completed peppers. So now would be a great time if anyone has any questions. I guess there are no questions right now. <laughs> I want to do a quick shout out to my son, Les, because this is his Dutch oven. And also this is his pudgy pie maker. <laughs> thank you. So, I know. so thank you, Leslie, <laughs> for letting us use your beautiful cast iron. So the great thing about the Dutch oven is that you can use um, the bottom part to make your filling. And then once you clean that out, you can use it to bake. Um, and just like cast iron, we want to make sure that this is seasoned properly. Uh, the seasoning allows it to create this non-stick kind of element to the pan, almost like your classic home non-stick pans, except without all the chemicals. Um, so you are going to open them up and we're not going to show the other side yet, uh, but you will have beautiful peppers to, to bring on the trail with you. Um, one to two um, for a full complete meal, or you can have as a pairing along with the fish or other entrees as well. Um, and like I said, you can eat this completely whole besides the seeds and the stem and take it off the trail with you. Diane, do you have a question? I do, sorry. That's okay. <laughs> Can you make the combination ahead of time? The filling yes. combination of the um, the mixture. Uh, yes, you can. Um, I wouldn't do this if you're carrying meat with you, um, just for safety precautions. Depending on your trail, unless you can carry that meat safely with you. Um, but especially for the vegetarian version, um, you can definitely carry this along with you, put it in a little cooler, it'll last a long time on the trail. Um, and then you can stuff the peppers or even have the peppers stuffed and then bring them with you on the trail for even less time. Um, yeah, that's a great question, thank you. The only thing I would add to that is one thing that people think about is they think, you know, they think milk, you know, can't be left out. Raw meat can't be left out. Be wary of making sure that you use proper refrigeration. If that's in a cooler, keeping cold things that are supposed to be cold, cold, and things that are supposed to be hot, hot. So when you're traveling, make sure you're traveling in a way that you can keep things cold because cooked, like cooked starches, like the wild rice can make you just as sick as a piece of meat that hasn't been refrigerated properly. So just be aware of that so that when you're going into the woods, if you're gonna cook anything ahead of time, then it needs to be kept cold in a cooler with ice. Okay. Um, another note I would like to make, uh, mm -hmm. as we are pulling in wild mushrooms to this uh, uh, recipe, um, wild mushrooms, be warned. Uh, make sure you understand what you are looking for when you are trying to find a wild mushroom. Uh, make sure you have the understanding of the location, um, its properties, and you understand how to clean it and um, address it when using in your meal. So especially for like lion's mane and tight clustered mushrooms, you want to peel from the bottom up to look for worms, eggs, or other delicious things that we find. <laughs> um, and you want to make sure that you want to avoid mushrooms like that, that have any sight of those. So as you can see, these are have clear, no holes or any diggings into them. Um, we can see that there's no eggs or anything planted in here, um, but I'm pulling from the bottom up because as you pull from the bottom up, then you can see if worms are hidden inside. If you pull from the top down, they can hide a little easier. So 
like I said, be wary, understand that you are foraging in the wild and it's very important <laughs> to know All right. about you. Is there any suggested seasonings besides nutmeg and rosemary? Uh, in addition to the thyme and garlic that we have, as well as the salt and pepper, um, you can add whatever seasonings you would like if you change the difference if you change the innards of your peppers, so let's say if you have a meat, you can have a little spiciness to it. Maybe add some paprika, red pepper flakes. Um, you can even have like a traditional Mexican side to it if you want. Mm -hmm. The stuffed pepper does not have to be by the recipe book. It's really whatever fillings you desire into it. You just wanna make sure that you have your base of rice, your main protein source and your seasonings. Um, this is what I like to put in my red, in my bell pepper stuffing, but that doesn't mean that you have to put those in there. Um, it's all up to you. It is your kitchen um, and you are the leader of what goes into your bell peppers. Great. Any suggestions for measuring or controlling temperature when cooking on a campfire? Um, keep a wearful eye on it. Um, you are working with fire that's very uncontrolled. So checking it often. Uh, making sure your fire is not too hot. So I wouldn't be putting your Dutch oven into the flame right when the flame is hot. I would wait until it's cooled down. You still have some red coals, but you don't have a, a huge flame. Um, sometimes if it's still a little dead, you can add a little coals on top, but that will fast, that will um, speed up the cooking process. It's a lot of learning and taking time to understand how long that your Dutch oven takes um, as well as working with your fire. Um, but it's a lot of just waiting and watching and making sure that you know what the end product looks like and that's what you're looking for. Um, there's not really an exact time because it's very uncontrolled when you're out on the trail. Okay, can you put a little water in the Dutch oven to help steam? I would not put, they should take one of those too. Oh. <laughs> yes, you should take a, a thermometer with you. That would always be helpful, especially if you have a meat protein um, into your uh, stuffed bell peppers. Going back to your question, I wouldn't put any water into your Dutch oven when making your stuffed bell peppers. While the steaming process may be helpful, um, it may, because of how hot um, a campfire is, um, it may weaken the shell of your bell peppers um, to the point where they might just fall apart. Um, if you're in a pinch and you really want to get these peppers rolling, I would steam them separately before putting in the filling, before doing anything else. Um, okay. But that's only if you're in a pinch. Um, I would rather if you have the time to make sure that they sit through the 30 minutes, 25, 30 minutes, um, because that will keep their shell and make them more portable on the trail and easier to eat. Okay. Can you repeat the at home temperature um, and for how long for the stuffed peppers? Of course, uh, 400 degrees uh, for a conventional oven. And you're gonna have that for about 30 to 40 minutes, depending on the quality of your oven. I have an oven at home that's an apartment oven and that took about 45 minutes. So this commercial oven took about 30. Um, so 30 to 40 minutes is your best bet, but you're looking for tenderized uh, peppers. Um, they may, may leak just a little bit, um, especially if you got some meat products in here, um, but they will be tender and they'll be easy to push a fork through. Okay, and another question is, what meat could you add to that um, stuffed pepper? That's a great question. You can add whatever meat you prefer. Um, beef is also a great substitute. Just watch uh, the leakage of fat. Uh, make sure you take account for that. Uh, you can even cook it beforehand would be your best bet to make sure that the bell pepper doesn't get soggy. Um, when you're doing that final cook, chicken is a great addition. Um, you can also add some other lean meats like turkey, even rabbit, if you catch it on the trail. Um, really, it's up to you and what pairings that you prefer to go into your peppers. Okay. And lastly, one more question. Assuming lion's mane has a stem, can you chop and include, include it? Lion's mane does not have a stem um, in general. Lion's mane will always come from when it grows on a log for 
lack of example, it will grow on a log and it will kind of stay into this bunch. What will happen is you will take your knife and you will cut all the way through, always leave about a fourth uh, for recultivation for the next uh, upbringing of the mushroom and it will just come off. This is essentially its stem right here and you can definitely eat that. That is totally edible, um, but it all comes out in one full swoop. There will be some left behind in the log because they do live um, they do grow in dead logs, um, but you, this little stem is all that you have versus the shiitake. Shiitake stems are a little rougher. You don't want to be eating the shiitake stem. Um, while it is edible, it's very rough um, and kind of hard to chew. So when you're working with shiitake, you always want to remove the stem and just eat the, the cap. Um, and with mushrooms, always make sure that you cook them. Um, our stomach linings can't really process mushrooms that well when eaten raw. So always cook your mushrooms. Thank you. Of course. Okay, we're gonna start on dessert now. A uh, little side note, I save my stems from my mushrooms and use them in stock. So that, that's a way I can reuse them without throwing them away. So if you're doing this at home, you can use those and just throw them in, you know, so you're any kind of stock and it just helps add to the flavor. So just a little side note about your mushroom stems. So I don't know if anyone's heard of pudgy pies. I love pudgy pies. They're so much fun to make. There's endless amounts of combination of flavors that you can make. And again, thank you, Leslie, for loaning me his pudgy pie maker. This is cast iron. You can buy it at any sort of like outdoors shop, like Meyer, Walmart, all of them, you can buy these. And these are cast iron. Uh, you can do these on your grill at home. So if you're doing say a backyard grill with your friends, you can actually do these on like, say you make dinner, you can make pudgy pies for dessert, which is really fun. That's actually how I cooked our pudgy pies today as I did them on our grill here in the kitchen. And it was brilliant. The best way to do this is warm it up. Be mindful that it's really hot. Um, you brush, you just have a bread, nice hearty bread is better. Um, something that this isn't, this is from the Marquette baking company, um, great bread that they have, but also it's hardier because it's a real bread without all the air and floof that you get from like a store-bought, like wonder bread. And so this will hold up better to our filling. And it's really simple. You're just going to open your pie maker. I know just take the whole thing off. This comes off. It's really easy. Make sure again, this is cast iron. So make sure it's properly seasoned. I was cooking this earlier. So that's what this is from, but that's okay. That just burns right off. That's the beauty of cast iron. Uh, it's really good to, it's really good to preheat it. I have it, it's warm, but you know, magic of TV, we're gonna have one of these done in about 10 seconds when we're here done. I'm just gonna, I use oil to keep it vegan because all these are vegan. You can use butter, absolutely. You're just gonna place this down in your maker. I'll show you the pumpkin pie one. So this is just canned pumpkin. That's nice because if you're taking it into the woods with you, uh, you can just take the can with a can opener. Um, a shout out to anyone who knows old time hockey, who's an Instagram person. Uh, he does a bunch of campfire stuff and he actually did this, this one and inspired, inspired my, this pudgy pie. Uh, this is, I like to mix it up a little. Pumpkin pie spice works great. That's one of your recipe, but this is actually Chinese five spice. And if you, if it just is a little different because it has a couple different spices in there, like anise is in there. Um, and the reason that matters is, you know, it's like, who, what's that? You know, you get the, what's that comment, which is always fun when you're cooking for people and entertaining. Then I have some marshmallows. You can marshmallow fluff like we have on the recipe, or you can use marshmallows. These are actually, um, gelatin free marshmallows. So what's nice about these is if someone is a vegetarian or vegan or allergic to any like mammal, you don't worry about it because these are gelatin free. So these are just going to go on here like this. And I think two marshmallows per pie is an appropriate amount of marshmallow in my life. So I just cut these up. They'll be a little sticky. The trick to sticky marshmallows is, is that you can cut them up and toss them in a little cornstarch and then they will not stick and you can still pack them away and they won't all stick together after you cut them up, which is super helpful. So I've just oiled my other side, my bread. I'm gonna put it together. This is super simple. I'm gonna put it together and squish it. 
Now I want to show you, sometimes the lid gets pushed back when you're pushing it. So I always push my lid a little forward like that. That way, when I'm closing it, it lines up perfectly. Then there's a little lock right here. You lock it. Now, if you're doing this fireside, you just put this right directly on your coals. Boop. And then you're just going to keep an eye on it and it's going to toast. So this takes about three to five minutes, depending on whether this is preheated. I can tell you your second and third ones are gonna be prettier than your first ones because the cast iron will be really hot and warmed through. And so you'll get a much more even crispy, you know, you won't have little pockets of heat um, toasting it differently on your bread. So it's important to think about is if you wanna preheat it um, because we were doing other demonstrations, it's not preheated right now, but so that's the pumpkin pie one. I also have this filling here that I made. And this is a fruits of the forest filling. And if you were doing this in a pie, you'd have like the big chunks, but this I made the filling because you can take it on the trail with you. This is actually pretty stable because it's got tons of sugar and tons of acid. And so this is mixed berries, strawberries, blackberries, raspberries, blueberries, rhubarb is very important in this mix and apples. And then I just did this with sugar and the fruit cooked it down till it was all nice and bubbly and then pulled it off my heat. And then once I pulled it off my heat, I put the vanilla in there. And the reason I wait to put vanilla in anything like this till the end is because our flavorings are often suspended in an alcohol solution and that's normal. So don't, it's cool. Like your almond extract, your vanilla extract. And if you put it in while it's still really hot, it'll actually evaporate really quickly and then you'll lose some of the flavor. So to maintain some of the flavor from the vanilla and get more of that vanilla flavor, I always let it cool a little bit. So it's not quite boiling temp. And then I mix in my flavoring. So then magic of TV, we're gonna get our stuff here. And here are two pudgy pies that I made. This is the fruits in the forest one. Yummy, look at the filling. Yeah, 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 it's so good. Right there, and you can see that nice toast on there. Then this is the pumpkin pie one. You can see it like oozed out. I can tell you that one, you're not gonna wanna share these. I cut them so you could see the inside, but really I just take them right out, hand them out. We just eat them, just eat them, the whole thing. And you can use, you could use a brioche. You could use a plain white loaf of bread. You could use, gosh, whole wheat sourdough would be awesome because you, when you have sweet, it's always good to have a little salty or sour with it. Um, so there's lots of different types of bread. Just make sure your bread is nice and hearty. So it holds up to the heat and it holds up to the moisture of your filling because that filling will heat up and it will soak. I mean, it soaks through the bread. So that's really important to keep in mind when you're making these. Does anybody have any questions about the pudgy pies? These are really fun to do like a pudgy pie bar. If you were like at your house and doing a grill out, you could have like all these different fillings and people come and come make their own pudgy pies. It'd be really cool. I, that's what I want to do. <laughs> so Diane, do we have any questions? We don't have any questions about the pudgy pies, but I do have one. Yeah. You can cook these in the oven as well. You could, but this won't fit in the oven. Right, right. <laughs> so if you were going to do that, what I would say is you would butter your bread and then you would put them in your oven and you just have to flip them halfway through so they get toasty roasty on both sides. That's all I would say to that. It'd probably work really well, well under a broiler, actually, to get nice crispy on the top and then flip them and do the crispy on the other side. You could do it in the oven that way. Yep. Just be mindful that they won't be squished. Like these are nice little packages, you know, when they come out, they've got kind of the sealed edges from the pie maker and you're not gonna get those sealed edges. You can see from this one too, kind of has sealed edges. You're not gonna get that if you do it in the oven, which is, you know, not a huge deal, but when you're on the campfire, that's nice to have the sealed edges because when you're eating, then your toppings aren't oozing out as this sure. topping is oozing out. Was the pudgy pie oil a combo of olive and canola? No, you would use, a. you don't want the olive oil flavor necessarily for your dessert. I mean, sometimes you do, but for this, I would use just a canola oil or a vegetable oil. So an expeller pressed canola oil is always best, so. Yep. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So that's your pudgy pie. And I'm going to put this over here. And now Trixie's going to show you some pretty phenomenal stuffed apples. 
Thank you, Chef Alden. Um, continuing with our leave no trace, bringing in the container and taking out what you have left over, we're gonna be doing a baked apple. So these baked apples, they're uh, taking out the core. They're a little brown, but that's okay. We just lost them to oxi oxidization. Um, but if you were going to do this at home, the best thing to do is cut the tops off and then you can close the top um, to create a little nice presentation. But when you're on the trail, you're just taking out the core, taking out the seeds and leaving this and leaving it hollow. Now these are kind of smaller apples. Um, so you might have to update the recipe if you have a larger apple. I'm using Granny Smith today, uh, but some great local variety apples are Braeburn or Northern Spy. Um, Apples like these are great for baking because they have this uh, a hearty inner, um, which allows them to bake without losing um, their composure. Um, so you can bake them for 30 to 40 minutes and they'll stay as a whole apple. Um, but today we're using Granny Smith, which Granny Smith is always a favorite for baking. Um, we are going to be filling it today with a walnut, walnut, uh, Madrul dates and chai spices. Um, chai spices contain of uh, cinnamon sticks, um, peppercorns, cloves, um, cardamom, and ginger. I use in this recipe, I used fresh ginger and I minced it. However, if you're going on the trail, the best thing to use is a dried ginger. Um, and what I've done with these spices is I've taken them and I've thrown them in the grinder or you can use a mortar and pestle and you can grind them up to add them to your walnuts. Um, the dates we are using today are very sweet by themselves. They're another great addition for a lot of baking uh, projects. Um, so you don't have to add sugar to this recipe. However, it is said on this recipe, if you like a little more sweeter apple, I have Cervanano sugar, which is kind of like a, a grainier sugar. And I love to use this in making as well. I feel like the sugar adds a great texture to the dishes better than a white sugar would. Um, what you're going to do is after you grind all your spices, you're gonna take your chopped walnuts. Um, I've just given these a rough chop because I wanna make sure that they fill into the apple. And you're going to mix these with your dates. Uh, your recipe says four to six. Just like I said before, it depends on the apple. It depends how much you're filling them. Um, but we mince them. However, they're going to stay sticky. So the best thing to do is to grab your dates and to put them in your mixture. The best thing to do is to use your hands. Now this bowl is a little tinier <laughs> than what I thought it was gonna do. But you're, the best thing to do is to mix it with your hands. I'm making a mess here, but that's okay. Um, you're gonna wanna mix it in your hands and then you're gonna wanna add your chai tea spices. Um, I've worked as a barista at my parents' shop, little coffee shop on 231, shout out to them. Hey, mom and dad. Um, and I've learned to love chai tea um, and all the spices that come with it. The complex of flavors, thank you. The complex of flavors that chai tea offers um, in, in its drink as well as on its own is just mesmerizing to me. Um, and as well as it's great, uh, the black tea provides a great pick me up. Um, usually it's a great alternative. If you're trying to get rid of coffee, chai tea is your first alternative. Um, and we're just gonna mix these up to make sure that the Montreal dates are covered, the walnuts are covered. I'm gonna add a little more chai tea spice. Um, and we got our ginger in here as well. And what you're gonna do is you are going to stuff them into your apples. Uh, I like to make sure that they are really stuffed when I'm stuffing them. Um, I'm pushing my thumb into them, making sure that I'm really filling these. Um, as they cook, the apple will soften. Um, so that leaves a little more room for your filling to uh, level out. So make sure you're really stuffing these apples. Um, the dates are great for this because they kind of act like as a glue as you're trying to stuff them. And when you throw them into the oven or your Dutch oven, uh, you're going to want to add, oops, leave it out for a second, but you're going to want to add a little slab of butter to the top. This is vegan butter, um, but you can use any butter that you prefer. Add that there. So 
like I said, we're going to come back for the Dutch oven. The great thing about this recipe is you can have both of them done at the same time. They take the same amount of time to cook um, and their doneness is the same time as well. You are looking for a tender apple that you can stick your fork through. Uh, so the great reveal on the other side of this Dutch oven is our apples. So what I did here was I kind of created a little trough for my apples. Like I said before, um, sometimes these peppers leak and I didn't want them to mix. So I created a little trough for them, uh, keeping them separated so I don't get pepper juices in my apple and I don't get apple juices into my pepper. Um, and these will cook the same time, the same process as we did with the Dutch oven, uh, low steady coals, um, keeping them kind of covered maybe some coals on top uh, to create that baking sim uh, simulation. Um, and these are gonna cook for about 20 to 30 minutes on the fire. Uh, for an oven, it's the same process, 400 degrees in a nine by 13 pan for about 30 to 40 minutes, depending on your oven. Um, and what the butter has done as it's been cooking is kind of softened the apple a little bit and given it a little uh, buttery flavor as well. Uh, you can pair these with vanilla ice cream. Um, if you don't want the apple, this mixture is great over vanilla ice cream or yogurt as well. Um, but these, the, these two recipes together uh, will provide you a full meal for on the trail. Uh, is there any questions? <laughs> yes, Trixie. So I have a guest that would like to know, um, other than the Granny Smith apple, is there any other apples that you would recommend for this? Yes, of course. Um, two great uh, uh, Michigan varieties are the Brayburn and the Northern Spy. Um, they have kind of a similar hardiness to them, so they can handle the baking process. Um, and they provide a great flavor um, and kind of um, the Northern Spy has a little spice to it that would be great with the chai tea and great with the dates and walnuts as well. Um, however, we're not really in apple season right now. Um, so Granny Smith, you could also try a Honeycrisp apple. Honeycrisp apples are really thick as well and they could handle that baking process um, if you're not looking to use a Granny Smith at this time. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Let's see if I have another question. Okay. Um, Lynn says, I'm curious if you have a recommendation for oven gloves for taking the Dutch oven off the fire for when you are on the trail. That is a good question. Um, the Dutch oven will get hot, which is great because you can take it out of the fire and it will keep the inside warm while you're waiting um, to eat. Um, the best thing for you um, is to get one of those gloves um, that you can put on um, that kind of go around your wrist, um, however you are dealing with fire. Um, so just be careful and don't burn yourself. Um, but when you're working with the Dutch oven on the, on the, on the fire, um, watch where you put the Dutch oven. Um, I wouldn't put it directly in the center if you've got a big fire going. Um, I would kind of keep it off to the side so you could grab it when you need to, um, as well as I wouldn't completely cover it in coals. Uh, as the recipe states, we kind of nestle it and we want it a little halfway um, and maybe coals on the top. Um, but I would just, um, I don't have any particular brands in mind, but I would look for a really uh, hearty glove that you can put on that would protect your wrists and hands um, when working with a Dutch oven. Um, sometimes um, if you have the equipment, you could also put it on a little stand above the fire. Um, but in that case, you would need to keep that fire high and consistent. While if you just put it into the coals, um, you have a little more control with temperature, um, but you also, um, it's a little easier to maintain and keep the coals rolling for that baking uh, stimulation. I would also say, I'm just gonna add to that a little bit, is that in the kitchen, we use really, really dry towels. The trick to these is you wanna have something with like a hook so you could pull the Dutch oven away from the coals. And if you had a really, really dry towel, that works actually really well. Um, cotton, not a synthetic fabric. <laughs> A hot, a dry cotton towel that is works wonders. So, mm -hmm. yep. So Thank if you. You, we can keep asking questions, but for the sake of time, um, I'm going to, this is a great time to ask questions because I'm going to do our drink 
And there are a couple of times where we're gonna have a pause while we let our cool smoking uh, contraption here do its magic. And so it'll be a great time to ask more questions. So I'm gonna do a smoked old fashioned. So smoking guns, these little smoking kits are super in style right now and they're really fun. I was able to buy a kit that had four different types of wood, has this little contraption here that you can see that holds the wood chips for me with a lid here as well that kind of forces the smoke downward. And this little torch that goes with it, so cute. And it's got some other stuff. And that was only about 60 bucks on Amazon. So it's pretty attainable. It's kind of fun. So if you're an adventurous type of person, you wanna try something new with maybe an old favorite, like I'm gonna do an old fashioned today. This is a great thing to kind of bring something new to an old drink. So I'm gonna start with just a teaspoon of sugar. In the recipe, it says to do a um, sugar cube. You can do that too. Then we're gonna put four dashes of bitters in here. These are the aromatic bitters, pretty standard stuff here. One, two, three, four. Because what we're gonna do is we're gonna add some smoke flavor to these components before we the rest of the drink. We have our orange peel, we're gonna throw in there. Marchino cherry. These are a Bordeaux Marchino cherry, which I actually vastly prefer to the traditional Marchino cherry. One, it has better flavor. And two, it doesn't have all that artificial color and flavor in it, which I really like because cherries are awesome. Why would we take all of their flavor out and then add fake flavor to it? So then we're gonna take this. This is the fun part about playing with fire. This little torch here. And we're gonna light it on fire. Once I've got a little good flame here, I let it well, a little bit more here. There we go. Okay, and then I'm gonna cover her up like this. And I don't know if you, the camera can pick it up, but the smoke is starting to go down into the glass. Let's do that. You can kind of see some of the, a little bit. Good. So we're gonna let this sit a second. If we have any questions, now's a great time. The smoke has kind of gone down into the glass and is now settling on our ingredients to help flavor those ingredients. Okay, so Allison has said, have you tried hemp seeds or pumpkin seeds or anything in place of nuts um, for the apple mixture for people with oh. nut allergies? So my mom who's watching, hi mom, uh, she uses sunflower seeds a lot, which are fantastic replacers for nuts, but pepitas are great too. Um, do you have any other suggestions, Trixie? Pepitas was going to be my suggestion. Um, yeah. They have a great nutty flavor. I also love them on salads. Um, that would be a, a, an excellent uh, substitute for that. Um, that's a really great question because I would have immediately gone for, for the pepitas. Yeah. But yeah, sunflower seeds are actually my go-to now. Thanks, mom. <laughs> so now I'm gonna take this off. Now the smoke has settled. I'm gonna hey, take chef, my machine. Yep. What kind of wood chips can you use for that? So this is, I'm using cherry for obvious reasons because I'm using a cherry in my drink here. I'm gonna take my orange peel out, um, but pecan would probably be really good if you want a nutty component. Um, just whenever you're smoking, you have to make sure that the wood doesn't compete with your food. And that goes the same with a drink. That's why I chose a cherry wood because that actually complements the cherry in the drink instead of competes with the flavors. So I'm gonna muddle this sugar a little bit and I'm just gonna throw in a dash of water. The recipe calls for a half a teaspoon, but I'm just muddling that up there so that our sugar dissolves. It's very exciting times in the muddling world. Okay, then I'm going to add my whiskey here. This is a Traverse City Brewing Company whiskey, which is pretty fun. I'm gonna add my ice like that. I'm just gonna swirl it a little bit to kind of get the sugar off the bottom there. Great, then I want to take my orange peel and give it a little squeeze. And the reason we give our orange peel a little squeeze is it releases those nice oils. Then to enhance the flavor, I'm gonna take it and actually rub it around the rim of the glass so that when someone drinks this, they're gonna get that orange flavor from that. Pop that in there. A little bit more ice in there, hello. 
and then my cherry. Then to finish her off, if you have one of those really great ice makers that makes the really beautiful big cubes, that's this would be a great drink for that. So I'm gonna just light this baby on fire. Oh yeah, that smoke's going down there now. That's beautiful. So smoke is settling. It looks kind of like a, a foggy morning on Lake Superior. <laughs> and that's gonna sit for a minute or two. And then once that's done, we're gonna pull it off and you can serve that drink to whomever wants it. Like me, just kidding. <laughs> Do we have any questions? Um, yes, actually, did the torch come with the smoking kit? And what it was did. the fuel for the torch? So this is a little butane torch. So it's pretty cool. It doesn't come pre-filled. Obviously you don't wanna be mailing that in the mail, but it has a little nozzle on the bottom and you can get that at anywhere you sell a lighter, you can find this like little butane cartridges and you can see it has a little nozzle on it and it literally just press the charge, the cartridge to it and it fills it up, which is pretty neat. And it's pretty inexpensive. It's just a few dollars to get one of those. So there, now that the smoke is settled, I pull it off and you can be very dramatic if you wanna do this. Cause like you pull it off and you like, you see the smoke swirl around. And then we have this beautiful, I wish we had smell of vision cause you can smell that cherry smoke and it's really nice. That with the apple over here, I can smell the chai spices and the smoke and it's just, whew, it's awesome. All right, do we have any other questions? No other questions at this time. Okay, well, I hope that you've enjoyed our time together. I have. Trixie, have you enjoyed your time together? I have enjoyed our time together. Fantastic. So thank you so much. And thank you, Trixie, so much. She's such an asset to our team. And I'm so excited to be able to work with her today. And I hope that you go out and experiment and have fun with some of these flavors. And as always, it's always my hope to uh, get you in the kitchen and trying something a little new or different. And uh, we love to hear about them. So don't be afraid to reach out to either your alumni association or us in dining and let us know like, hey, we tried this or whatever. And we would love to hear about that because I love hearing your stories about getting in the kitchen and trying something new. So y'all have an awesome night. Thank you so much. Let's make sure Kylie doesn't have any housekeeping to do or Diane and away we go. Thank you. Right. Thanks so much. That was awesome. Um, thank you all so much for joining us. And um, we look forward to continuing the series in the fall. So stay tuned. Um, also, we'll be sending out a short survey after this. So make sure you keep an eye on your email and we will have the link to the recording in case you need to go back and um, get some inspiration when you go to make these recipes yourself. Um, also be choosing one winner from tonight's attendees to receive a free alumni shirt. So keep an eye on your email for that. And um, keep up with us on social media. And we really hope to see you again soon, whether it's in person at one of our events or again at some of our digital events in the fall. So thank you all so much. We really appreciate it. And uh, we'll see you again soon. Happy camping. <laughs>